It's my pleasure today to introduce our experienced AD panel. We are fortunate to have three former athletic directors that are among the very best athletic directors in the country. Our panel includes Debbie Yao, who had outstanding tenures at St. Louis as an athletic director, the University of Maryland, and most recently, NC State. Delos Dodds was the athletic director at Kansas State and then moved on to have a legendary career as the athletic director at the University of Texas. Craig Littlepage served in, served in many administrative roles at the University of Virginia for nearly 27 years. Craig was the athletic director for 16 of those years where they had tremendous success in all facets of the program. The interesting common thread among Debbie, Delos, and Craig, they all started out as coaches and then moved into administration. The first question that I'm gonna ask our panelists is in a fairly concise manner, what was the career path prior to becoming an athletic director? Debbie, let's start with you. Good morning to everyone. Um, First of all, the only thing I want to say about the career path is that I, I didn't mean to become an athletic director because at the point in time where I did, women weren't. So it wasn't a dream to become an AD, but the career path was a, a high school English teacher and basketball coach uh, and then coaching, of course, as Jeff said, at Kentucky, uh, ORU and Florida, and then into administration at Florida into a great fundraising group called Gator Boosters. Uh, one of the elite organizations and learned a lot there uh, and then into administration at UNC Greensboro, which was on track to become a division one program. Uh, their theme was division one in 91, I believe. And uh, from there became the athletic director uh, at St. Louis University in uh, June of, of 1990. Uh, so, so went from coaching uh, into, uh, into administration uh, which probably isn't, Jeff, as, as common today as it was then, uh, but turned out to be very useful in terms of, of um, working with coaches and understanding how coaches think. Craig, good to see you, my friend. Could you give good us morning, your- Good morning, Jeff, and good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I- uh, was a student athlete at the University of Pennsylvania, played basketball there on some uh, great teams in the early 70s uh, at Penn. Uh, went to uh, the NCAA tournament uh, every year that, uh, that I played, not that I was a big reason for that, but uh, uh, upon graduation, I was fortunate that uh, I had a uh, mentor, uh, Roly Massimino, who had been an assistant coach at the University of Pennsylvania the last couple of years that I was a player there, he took me uh, with him when he got the head coaching position at Villanova University. For two years. And then um, I, I thought that I was going to use my uh, Penn degree. So I uh, got out of coaching for about three weeks uh, before I realized that it was a big mistake that uh, uh, coaching and working with young people was uh, kind of in my blood and was a passion for me. So uh, I was able to get an assistant coaching job right after that at Yale University where I stayed for a year, uh, then came to University of Virginia as an assistant coach for six years, then at uh, University of Pennsylvania as the head coach for three years, Rutgers University as the head coach for three years, uh, got let go at Rutgers, uh, came back to Charlottesville. Uh, uh, Terry Holland uh, brought me back on the staff. I stayed two more years. Uh, he retired from coaching, and then I went into administration here at UVA. So I went from an assistant AD, associate AD, senior associate AD, interim AD on two different occasions, and then in 2001, uh, became the athletics director, and I was here as the AD and, uh, until 2017. Thanks, Craig. We're going to start with the questions uh, that I'm going to ask, but I would say to each of you, please start putting in your name and university into the chat session so that I can have you, uh, you know, state your own questions. Debbie, we're going to start with you. 
How important is the relationship with the president and how did you foster that relationship to ensure alignment between you and the president? Great question and important question. I think uh, the concept of alignment starts when you're interviewed. Uh, unfortunately, most of us, when we're being interviewed, are so excited about the possibility of getting the job. We're not thinking a lot about that. We're thinking some about that, but we're really thinking, I wonder if I can get this job. Um, so I've seen colleagues along the way end up with bad matches uh, with their bosses, their presidents. Um, I, Jeff, I think the main thing to remember is it isn't about me. It isn't about you, it's about them and their vision, honestly, for the university and how, the athlete, how they see the athletic program uh, fitting into that vision. That's why you really do need to have some similarities in, in terms of how you think philosophically about what athletics means to the university. Um, and once you have that and you know you have that, I think the burden is on us as ADs to be the ones to ask the questions to be sure things are going well. In other words, we should be asking the questions like, they're basic questions, but they're important. How would you like for me to communicate with you routinely? Do you want me to text you? Do you would you prefer I send you an email? Would you prefer that I pick the phone up and call you? Under what circumstances would that look different? Uh, and I've you know, worked for several presidents and they're all different. Uh, and I had one who just loved to text. And so we did constantly. I mean, I could tell he wanted to know any good thing or anything that was bothering me. We just text. And I've had other, another one who absolutely would not have wanted that at all. And so the burden is on us to try figure out uh, and ask those questions to, and then come back, not just ask one time, but come back in and ask later, how's it going with us in terms of communication? Now, a lot of people don't want to ask that question. They're kind of afraid of the answer. You can't be afraid of the answer. You have to go ahead. They'll be so relieved that you care enough to ask uh, and, they'll, and they'll tell you. And then you'll be in better shape with them. Yeah, I think that's a real important point, Debbie, is how does that president want to get communication from you? I had one president who uh, I talked to five out of seven days on the phone, and I had another president that he, he didn't care about the phone. It was texting every day, every night, after every game. So uh, good, good insight. Thank you. Hey, Craig, I want to ask you about uh, what you look for in coaching candidates and the importance of finding the right fit for your respective university. And we all know that two of your uh, last hires were excellent, Bronco Mendenhall in football and, and certainly Tony Bennett. So give us some insights, please. Well, uh, thank you for the question, Jeff. And let me first say that I, I agree with everything that, uh, that, that Debbie had to say about that relationship. And I think that the relationship between a director of athletics and a university or president is probably the thing that's going to make or break uh, one's uh, success in the role. Obviously, you need to have competitive success and abide by the rules. Uh, uh, student athletes have to graduate. But I, I think right at the top of the list of things that uh, uh, aspiring ADs need to know about and begin to think strategically about is how they are going to uh, develop and then enhance uh, uh, that relationship. Um, Jeff, as it relates to, as it relates to uh, uh, great coaches, uh, we were very fortunate in the 16 years I was the director of athletics to hire some great coaches. And you know, even beyond uh, Bronco Mendenhall and Tony Bennett, uh, we, have, uh, we hired Brian O'Connor as our head baseball coach. And uh, he won a College World uh, Series uh, uh, not too long ago. And he's one of the outstanding uh, baseball coaches in the country uh, and has gone to a number of, of, of uh, College World Series. Ryan Bowen was our head uh, tennis coach, and I can't even count the number of uh, national championships, ACC championships that he won, but uh, he also uh, has an ACC record of, I think it's like 150 consecutive wins against uh, ACC competition over the course of his career. Uh, uh, Steve Swanson, our head women's 
Uh, soccer coach is one of the outstanding soccer coaches in the country, George Geldovacho on the men's side of the soccer. But anyway, uh, one, one of the things I think is very important is what you said. It's, it's, it's about fit in terms of your institution and in terms of the culture that you want to develop within, uh, with, within the athletics program. So I think a lot of it comes down to the kind of profile that you might build. And that profile comes as a result of doing a lot of time studying uh, one's environment. And when I talk about the environment, I talk, talk not only about the, uh, the institution itself, but uh, also uh, the environment inside one's uh, athletics department. And I think once you become the expert on uh, your environment, you have an opportunity then to start to think about uh, culture and, and developing culture. And then as it relates to uh, actually picking people, uh, I think that uh, the, the right fit uh, comes as a result of the kinds of things that you do in an interview context and making sure, Debbie talked about alignment with your president, making sure that the, uh, the, the values, the, the, the types of things that you're going to uh, emphasize as far as your program is concerned are a big part of the interview process so that the expectations can be uh, very clearly established uh, over the course of uh, that person's uh, time. I also found that uh, the people that are going to be top for performers, they have a lot of uh, common traits in terms of uh, integrity, in terms of collegiality, professionalism, respect for education, et cetera, et cetera. But even beyond that, uh, the thing that I uh, have, have found with all those people that I mentioned and more that I've uh, had the opportunity to work alongside of, Bruce Arena, uh, Debbie Ryan, Dom Stars, you men's across. I mean, I've had the opportunity to work alongside of some great coaches. The really good ones want to be held accountable. Uh, they want to have uh, high uh, goals and achievements and expectations. And as I said before, they're not afraid to be held account accountable for results. And uh, the, the people that uh, we brought to the University of Virginia during the, the 16 years I was the athletics director and before that an associate, et cetera, were all people that had very clear visions about what could be done at the University of Virginia. And then all they wanted to know was how they could help me as an athletics director, how they could help the department, as well as how all that connected with uh, the greater vision that our presidents had for the University of Virginia. So those are the, the thoughts that I would have on uh, how we were able to pick uh, great people that performed at a very high level at the University of Virginia. Thanks, Craig. Uh, Debbie and Craig, uh, for our aspiring ADs and back on communications for a minute, would you both agree that when bad news is coming down the pike, that the first person you need to inform is the president uh, so that he doesn't hear from somebody else? What's, what's your take on that, Debbie? Can't get to him or her quickly enough. Uh, her, under those circumstances, to deliver that message in person, it might not be nest, might not be possible, but would prefer to do that in person because as part of that, there's gonna be a discussion about what's next. And I, it's always a good idea if you're going to deliver bad news to your boss that you have some idea of what you think you should do. You can offer an alternative uh, for discussion. Uh, depending on how serious the issue is, I, I, I wouldn't suggest going in and saying this has happened and this is what we're going to do. It, you know, it's just a matter of wording. This is what I think might be the best course of action for us to take or, or more prudent course of action. Um, some exercising some common sense and how you approach it. Thanks, Debbie. I appreciate that. Hey, Debbie, let me ask you this. How, how did you professionally develop your staff and prepare them for the next job, whether it was in your department or at another university? Well, I, I really enjoy uh, expanding duties. So I, I think that that prepares them better than anything that you can anything else you can do. Obviously, uh, uh, ongoing uh, education uh, through NACTA or LEAD One or uh, wherever uh, matters. Uh, and there certainly is a place for that, but I'm not as big on that as a number of ADs are. 
uh, I, I think it's okay, but I've had senior staff say, I want to go to these two. And I would say, pick one, pick the one that you really think is going to be valuable. Uh, and the rest of the time, let's, let's stay home and take care of, you know, whether it was Maryland or NC State, because there's a lot of work to do. But I, I have found, Jeff, that expanding people's duties is so appreciated and gives them that opportunity to do something new, something fresh, to learn something, and they get it on that resume, and they know they're helping themselves and getting ready for the next step. Thank you. Uh, Craig, you uh, must have been looking in the crystal ball because the second question I was going to ask you about was, question, was culture. How important is culture in the athletic department? How did you establish and reinforce that culture through your leadership and communication? Well, I, I uh, talked earlier about understanding one's environment. And uh, I always felt as though uh, one of the most important things for me and for my success, and therefore the success of the athletics department was that I had to be the expert on uh, the environment that we were working in. And again, how the athletics department was going to fit and support the, the, uh, the broader mission uh, of, the, of the University of Virginia. Uh, and again, uh, a lot of the, the establishment and the building of culture was articulated uh, in the interviews that we had with the candidates for the position so that the coaches came in with a good understanding of what our expectations are. Um, and for us at the University of Virginia, um, uh, and this deals a little bit with the question that Debbie answered, you know, informing the president. For the two presidents that I worked for at the University of Virginia, the very first things that they said to me uh, when I began working with them is, uh, as well as the other VPs at the university, uh, no surprises. Uh, I don't want Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes knocking on my, uh, knocking on my door at seven o'clock uh, on uh, Monday morning telling me about something that happened uh, uh, over the weekend. Um, and in addition to the uh, uh, communication, um, th there has to be a, I felt as though there had to be a, a very strong relationship, personal as well as professional relationship not only with the university, but also with the other vice presidents at the university, so that I could have a really good understanding uh, as to what their goals were, uh, what the missions of their schools and departments or units might have been, and uh, to be able to share uh, my perspective on what it was that athletics could do for them and or what athletics was doing to support the broader uh, university uh, uh, initiatives. So um, when we would bring in candidates, uh, we would make sure that they understood uh, the importance of their roles in not just being high paid instructors, but to be uh, along the lines of um, uh, the model that John Wooden established years ago as a very successful uh, basketball coach at UCLA, the model of a teacher coach, that their roles went beyond just being an instructor, but they were educators. Uh, and as such, they had to uh, really take seriously the role that they had as leading educators within the University of Virginia. So we asked them to also to, to broaden their relationships and to broaden their perspectives and understanding of what else was going on around the university, excuse me, at the university in addition uh, to athletics. And they all really took to that uh, and uh, uh, really cherished the role of being uh, viewed not just as coaches, uh, but as educators themselves and to be respected around the University of uh, Virginia uh, as, as I said earlier, as uh, leading educators, uh, although in uh, a very small segment of the uh, student population, but nonetheless a very visible uh, segment uh, of the University of Virginia. And I'll tell this one quick story because I think it does kind of speak to the kind of culture that we were able to build in the athletics department with our coaches. We had a uh, fundraising uh, board meeting a number of years ago at which um, during the lunch break of, uh, uh, during the lunchtime of uh, these meetings, traditionally, we would invite a number of coaches 
maybe three will come in, meet the, uh, uh, the, the leadership of our fundraising board, uh, say a few things about their program, you know, what it was that was going on with recruiting, et cetera, et cetera. And this, this happened very spontaneously. Um, uh, as the portion of the lunch came to the part where the coaches spoke, um, uh, the head of the board uh, asked the head football coach to come up and uh, to speak for a few minutes because he had to leave early to go on a recruiting assignment. Uh, Mike London was the head coach at the time. Uh, so Mike came up and he talked for maybe a minute about it, the football program, you know, that sort of thing. And then he spent the next five minutes talking about the other head coaches that were there. And he talked about his relationship with the wrestling coach, you know, I have a daughter that plays, uh, you know, soccer, I think it was, and, uh, you know, got to know Steve Swanson as a result of, you know, the, the, the love that uh, my family has for soccer, et cetera, et cetera. And then he left. And then the wrestling coach got up and he talked about the soccer coach and all the other coaches. And so and three or four coaches uh, spent very little time talking about themselves and their own program. They talked about the programs and the quality of the other coaches uh, that were there, uh, that were part of that meeting and a part of the, the staff overall. And then one last quick story. Um, uh, when we, we brought in, uh, and I can't remember which coach it was right now, he talked about moving into his office for the first time on a Sunday afternoon and that the uh, head football coach happened to be in the office that, uh, that Sunday afternoon. Uh, our head football coach at the time was Al Gro, And he said that Al Gro for an hour helped him move his boxes and stuff out of his car into his new office. So I think that those are just examples of the types of things that we tried to de develop in terms of culture, professionalism, respect for education, understanding of the broader university, and then the importance of relationships, uh, coaches that would go to see the other sports, uh, uh, their teams play, and you know that sort of thing. Thanks, Craig. I think your point about coaches being educators is vital. And I think I could speak for both you and Debbie and myself that we viewed ourselves as educators and, and had an important part of the educational process of our student athletes. Let's go to Marcy from the Absolutely. University of San Diego. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, my question is really related to your first year, but you can even expand beyond that. But what were some of the biggest hurdles you faced in your first year as your as an AD? Debbie, why don't you go first? Well, what I faced 30 years ago uh, is very different in year one than what I faced uh, 11 years ago when I started at NC State, having a <laughs> I've only been retired 18 months. So I'm trying, I'm just thinking through that. It, what's great is that the, the stigma of a female being an AD is, is pretty much gone. Uh, there, the, the negative stigma, the, this, this is, it's okay, people get it. And I, I'm very grateful for that, that it isn't what it was 30 years ago. Um, you know, <laughs> the challenges are gonna go back to communication initially. Everything goes back to that, I think in terms of beginning to share your vision. And I do think it matters how quickly you can get to your entire staff to have an all staff meeting. Um, I mean, we're talking about the first week. Uh, there, there just are things you need to take care of. And, and there are so many great and talented ADs who can talk about this in seminars about uh, who you need to get to first or they with key boosters, uh, key colleagues on campus uh, all, who also report to the president. Uh, leadership among your student athletes, uh, but your entire staff, where you continue to have that opportunity to say, this is who I am. This is why I'm here. One of the things I always said to our coaches, and some, and most of the time it worked, but it didn't always work. I, I would, I don't, but I meant it. In other words, you were here before I was here. That means someone else hired you. I don't care. You are my coach because I'm now the AD. You're my coach. And I really meant it. Uh, you know, they, they worry about that a lot. Um, and, and then if they're very successful, you can have some very odd conversations. I had one one time uh, with a revenue sport coach who said, my first meeting with him, he said, well, so-and-so, the former AD, 
you know, we, we had a great relationship and he said, you're going to have to re-recruit me for me to stay here. And I remember thinking about his record and thinking, nah, nah I don't think so. <laughs> no, we need to have a different kind of balance in that relationship. I don't think I'm going to re-recruit you. I just want to know what we need to do to get things to the next level uh, working together. So I, I do think communication is a key and establishing with them that you're there, but you, you want the, it's, let me just say this, and, and then Craig and, and Jeff can say what they think. I would much rather inherit coaches and have them be successful for the long term than go through what you go through when you have to terminate a staff and then go out there and try to hire. Uh, and it would be as insane as it's ever been today, but that will, that is there. Uh, it's just better. Some ADs, I don't think many, but there are a few that just want, quote unquote, their, their guy. Wow, that's short-sighted as far as I'm concerned. See if you can work it out with the ones that are already there. Thanks, Debbie. Craig, you want to chime in on that one? Yeah, uh, and I agree with so much that, that, that Debbie has to say. My situation here at Virginia uh, was a little bit different because I had been at the University of Virginia for a long time. And I had also been the interim athletics director right before taking over. So the learning curve, as far as the institution, in terms of the important people, in terms of the coaches in particular, was going to be much shorter. I knew the uh, coaches because I was the uh, sports supervisor for just about all of them. And uh, I knew the good and the bad. I knew where you know, some of the uh, bodies were, were, were buried, uh, et cetera. So um, my, my attention in the first year was focused uh, primarily on finances. Again, given that I kind of knew the environment, knew the people, et cetera, et cetera, had a relationship with the president, uh, even prior to becoming the interim athletics director, he had been our dean of admissions. I worked with him for a long time in that role. Uh, so we had, uh, at, at the point that I was the interim athletics director in the summer of 2001, uh, the university had appointed a task force which was going to study the finances and the operations of the athletics department. And at the end of that uh, task force, uh, it was uh, determined that we had a structural uh, deficit in our, uh, in our budget. And if we didn't do something uh, in the short term, over the course of the next four years, we, we were going to accumulate over $10 million of debt. And so uh, the options that the task force provided were A, cut sports, B, tier sports, or C, get serious about things and raise the money that you need to build facilities, to fund all the scholarships, and to uh, build a quality coaching staff. Uh, the board of visitors at the university spoke very clearly that they were not going to allow us to uh, cut any sports, that we were going to continue to sponsor 25 sports. They weren't going to allow us to tier any sports, that is to relegate some of our sports to like uh, glorified uh, uh, club status. But at the University of Virginia, they said, we are about excellence. And the excellence that we want is not just in academics, but it also should include, uh, uh, not just in academics, but it should also include uh, athletics. And they asked me as the interim AD and then as the uh, director of athletics shortly thereafter, to give them the blueprint for what it was that the University of Virginia Athletics program, program could achieve and what would it take to get us there. And as I said, that uh, really did focus on funding and uh, the uh, Board of Visitors supported us in terms of increasing student fees over a five-year period, in terms of the fundraising itself, in terms of opening up opportunities for us to approach some of the key donors uh, to the university uh, and so in, in so many ways, that was the, the, the facilitator for us being able to build our plan. So we invested very heavily in people. That is that we uh, uh, fully funded all of our sports programs, uh, fund, uh, uh, funding people or you know, investing in people also meant that we were going to uh, uh, provide full, uh, full staffing for all of our sports. Prior to the task force, 
we had some of our head coaches that were part-time and certainly a lot of assistant coaches that were part-time. We were going to uh, hire full-time coaches up to the NCAA maximums, which created a little bit of an issue, and I'll uh, describe that real quickly. Uh, there were coaches on our staff that I knew weren't going to be with us for the long haul. Again, because I'd worked and supervised with many of them, this very ambitious future that we had uh, and that we articulated, uh, unfortunately, was not going to include all the people that were on the coaching staff. So I was going to have to uh, those difficult conversations that Debbie alluded uh, before, simply because you know they were really good people, but they weren't going to be in the model of what we needed to advance our program. So we invested in people, uh, we invested in facilities, which was a very, very critical part. We had a, uh, an aging basketball facility. We had um, uh, a football stadium that was just at that point undergoing extensive renovations, but was kind of bringing us into the modern era of, of, of college sports. Uh, and, and that was extremely important. So uh, as I said, uh, to make the long story short, uh, the critical issue for me was going to be on the funding. And then as Debbie alluded, the communications piece, the communication that I was going to have to have with people that were going to be moved into different areas so that we could open up opportunities to bring the kinds of coaches that I felt were going to be needed to advance. Yeah. Thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, also, it, it's interesting when you're an athletic director coming into a new school as, as opposed to being an internal candidate. Uh, a lot of different nuances there. Marcy, thank you for that question. Uh, Terry, would you, from UNC Asheville, would you ask your question to Debbie, please? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Terry Burney, UNC Asheville. Uh, if you could discuss the important importance and balance of relationship between the athletic director and donors? The balance and the relationship. Um, well, I, I think there always has to be this overt respect for what they do for the university. And I say that now that I'm one of them. I was one of them, of course, as an AD. I was providing money to the scholarship fund, but it's still different because I was on staff. So now I'm fully transitioned into one of, one of them. Um, and you, you do notice in terms of the communications, uh, every AD has his or her own style. Uh, it sounds insane, but I responded to every email myself. Uh, I'm not sure if I were, you know, a year and a half out, if I went back in at this point, uh, Terry, if I would do that again. It, uh, it sucked the life out of me to try to do that and my job, but I will tell you it paid enormous dividends in terms of trust because this is a trust relationship. What I found is that like staff, uh, boosters, donors will accept some bad news or, or a decision that they don't agree with as long as they trust who you are. You never want to tell them something that's not accurate. You, there's no need to to uh, try to, uh, you know, I think it's gonna turn out this way. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say it's gonna be that way when you don't really know. So I, I, so I think that that respect is foundational, but I also think that there have to be some boundaries. That's, if they trust you, they'll accept the boundaries. I had a, a donor who was on our fundraising board uh, uh, at NC State uh, in the Wolfpack Club on the board. And he, it, my very first year, he said, you are a pushy AD. And I, you know, we would tease about it. And I would say, you know, you wouldn't say that to a guy. You would not say that to a guy. And it just became a joke between the two of us. And he ended up being, we had this mutual respect so that nine years later when I left, that was one of the things, last things he said to me is you're such a pushy AD. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I knew it was a term of affection. Uh, because he understood, I'm, you know, you're not going to tell me who to hire. You're not going to, you, well, you can talk to me about it all you want to. I know you really care. So it's all grounded in respect. When you have self-confidence in your ability and you feel like your staff, your senior staff especially, is really well prepared because I leaned on them so heavily. Michael Lippitz, uh, Chris Boyer, I had some great staff who worked with me at uh, 
Maryland who also transitioned to NC State. Uh, so if you work with someone 18 years or 12 years, you have a lot, I mean, it's, it makes all the difference in the world. But I, I do think this is a trust relationship. Uh, and, and you, it, it's, I want to it sounds odd. I don't know if I want to say it this way, but it's like a, whether it's a, a best friend, uh, a BFF, or if it's a marriage, the fact is, if there's a lot of trust there, you, you've got some deposits that you've already made into the account and you can have some withdrawals occasionally uh, because of that trust. But if you don't have that trust, it, I don't see how you get that trust if you don't communicate with them. Some ADs will you know, do letters to the, the larger group. It, there, that's a style, that's just strictly a style uh, question, but it's important. And will it, will it uh, save your job if you, if you do, if you're lousy long enough? No, nor should it. Uh, but it can really make tough times, smooth out tough times, like in coaching transitions, if they trust you. Thanks, Debbie. And uh, thanks to Terry for that question. We're going to go to Alicia Tucker uh, from Norfolk State University. Uh, and Craig will take this question. Good morning. And um, thank you all again. I am deeply humbled to be here. I take a look at some of the participants and I'm just like, wow. Um, in addition to working at Norfolk State University, I am a proud Wahoo. So Craig, it is great seeing you again. Um, the question that I have is, you know, being an AD can sometimes be a lonely uh, position, very stressful. Uh, so can you talk about the importance of identifying a mentor or a support system for yourself as an AD? If particularly as a new AD? Well, I, I think, uh, and first of all, good, good morning, Alicia. It's good to see you. And uh, Alicia was a student athlete for us at the University of Virginia as well. And uh, she's a very, very talented uh, administrator. It's good to see you this morning. Um, I, I think that um, uh, A, being an African American, uh, and B, in your situation, uh, being a woman, that uh, those kinds of relationships, the, uh, the, the mentor uh, uh, relationship uh, is extremely important uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, and uh, in particular, because uh, those relationships will allow you to have access to the experience of uh, those people with whom you have developed that, that trust uh, and developed uh, that relationship. And there are always things that uh, an athletics director and administrator uh, generally will experience uh, that uh, you think are um, you know, unique to you and your circumstances, but uh, I will share with you, but there's, there are very few things that happen uh, at the institutional level or within an athletics department that haven't happened before that someone has uh, uh, not previously had that same kind of experience or that uh, somebody that you might have as a mentor knows somebody that has been through it. And, and I've had a, a, some conversations in recent months with uh, a number of athletics directors who were uh, going through uh, the financial circumstances um, facilitated by the pandemic and you know, uh, NCAA tournament that wasn't played, uh, championship uh, 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 conference championships that haven't been played, fundraising that has kind of stalled and ticket sales, et cetera, et cetera. And again, uh, these are situations that everybody has kind of gone through, maybe not to the extent that we're, we're going through them right now, but the mentors really do allow you to have that kind of perspective uh, to let you know that you're not out on an island and that uh, the, they have had uh, at least some experiences with immediately or uh, experience with other people that have gone through those kinds of situations that can at least help you kind of take a step back and maybe look at whatever the issue might be uh, from a from a different perspective. And uh, I, as a young administrator, uh, I would uh, very consciously and very strategically, uh, once a week, I would pick up the telephone and call somebody that was in the field of college athletics. Uh, and it was a phone call. I didn't want anything. It was all about the development of a relationship. And uh, over the years, I would, uh, as I've mentored young people myself, aspiring coaches, aspiring administrators, I would talk to them about 
investing in a phone call a week. And it was strictly the idea of letting that person know kind of what you're doing, how you're doing. Um, it would develop many times into uh, uh, also a personal relationship. But I can't tell you the number of uh, times that these types of relationships uh, really did yield benefit to me, uh, not only uh, when things were going bad and there was a problem, but uh, also from the standpoint of being able to share in the celebration when things were really going well. And for me then to be able to uh, give recognition uh, to the people that were so much a part of the, the types of things that I did. I, and I talked uh, recently, um, uh, and an example of this is uh, Tom Jernstead, who was the uh, vice president uh, for basketball at the NCAA, was basically the, uh, the, the father of the Final Four, so to speak. And Tom and I developed a very good relationship over a number of years. Uh, we win the men's basketball championship in 2019, and a lot of uh, you know, uh, uh, credit was being given to me uh, as the former athletics director and the person that hired our, our basketball coach. And one of the things that I did as I was asked to interview on a number of occasions about our basketball coach, Tony Bennett, I always talked about uh, the uh, conversation that I had with Tom Jernstead, who really uh, was the person that opened my eyes to this very talented young basketball coach who at the time was at Washington State University. And a lot of people going back uh, were, you know, Washington State University, University of Virginia. I mean, there's, there just doesn't seem to be any kind of commonality there. But it was as a result of a mentor uh, who uh, had seen the final four coaches over the course of close to 40 years who called me when he knew that we had a coaching vacancy. He says, Craig, I don't know what direction you're going to go or who might be on your list. But the guy I think would be perfect for the University of Virginia is this young guy, uh, Tony Bennett, uh, who's at Washington State University. So, you know, the, the, the fact that we had that relationship, uh, the fact that I would invest a phone call periodically, even after I had rotated off the basketball committee, uh, really was kind of a facilitator for one of the, uh, uh, the highlights of my career, being able to share in a small way with the University of Virginia winning the uh, winning Final Four. So the opportunity then to acknowledge and to recognize somebody that was a mentor uh, who did something uh, very, very significant for me in my career and for the University of Virginia. Thanks, Craig. Uh, Alicia, it's a great question uh, about mentors when you're an AD, but it's also important to have mentors as aspiring ADs. And Craig really hit on something, and that is relationships. It's not how many contacts that you have in your phone. It's how many relationships that you have and that you, and, and that you have those people you can turn to on the good days and on the bad days to help you. Yeah, Jeff, if, I, if I could just mention one more thing in terms of a mentor-mentee relationship, please, if, if there's one thing that I could... Um, uh, influence you in your approach. Don't wait until you need something to start to think about developing that relationship and to building that network. Uh, and I get calls occasionally, there are about four or five people that I've known for a number of years. The only time that I hear from them is when they're applying for a job and they want to use me as a reference. I'm not quite, a, quite as excited about that as it is the person that will call me periodically. And Alicia is one of those people, for example, that will call me uh, if she's having a problem. She will call me if she's coming to Charlottesville uh, to, to see a, a, a volleyball game between the University of Virginia and, and Norfolk State University, or if she just happens to be uh, coming through town. That's the kind of thing that really excites me when there's an ongoing and continuing relationship as opposed to I uh, hear from this person only once every three years when they're getting ready to apply for a job. So I think Alicia has been a good model for that type of uh, scenario of uh, mentoring uh, uh, and being a mentee is an ongoing relationship and not just a, uh, a sporadic type of relationship. You know, Craig, uh, you, you just mentioned something about mentees and mentors. 
It's the same thing when you become an AD and you go to a new campus. Go and meet the vice presidents. Go and meet the deans on as part of your entree to the campus. Don't wait till there's a situation that you have to engage a VP or engage a dean. Be proactive in that relationship. Yep. Uh, if correct. I, thanks, for Can I jump in just one more time, Jeff? Uh, I, I do a, a, an exercise with uh, aspiring uh, administrators um, uh, at NACTA and uh, other uh, times when I've done professional development. And the exercise is this. I ask the attendees, and these could be associate senior associate, executive associate ADs, get a piece of paper, ask them to write down the numbers one through 10 uh, vertically. And then we go through the exercise. Okay. What is the name of the university president? Two, what is the name of the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences? Three, what is the name of the uh, vice president for development at the university? Four, what is the name of the, uh, the dean of students? Five, what is the name of the vice president for student affairs? And go through a list of 10 significant individuals on one's campus that as a professional, whether you're an assistant AD, a head or assistant basketball coach, or the director of athletics, these are the people that you need to know. And uh, I, I think it's a worthwhile exercise for you to just kind of think through yourselves in your own careers where you are right now. Who are those people outside of the athletics department with whom you have not only knowledge, but you have a relationship? And who are the people? with whom you can strengthen that relationship for the benefit of A, the work that you're doing in the athletics department, but B, uh, could be to the benefit of your career as you look to move forward and ascend in your career. Thanks, Paige, appreciate that. We've got about 15 minutes. We've got uh, about six questions on the board. We're gonna try to answer them all. Uh, next question is from Dan McIver from Northern Kentucky University for Debbie. Thanks everyone, uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity and, and I'm looking forward to, day, to today and tomorrow. But my question uh, revolves around obviously uh, college athletics has had a, a lot of changes over the years. What do you feel are the biggest challenges ADs will have to deal with over the next five to 10 years? Well, you're dealing with it right now for one thing. I mean, anyone who's been an AD before COVID and after, there's a separation there. The, the greatest, uh, the worst thing that happened, you know, from a uh, structural, from, from a perspective that impacted everyone would have been the market crash of 2008, which was bad and impacted most everyone financially and their donor base and their ticket sales. It, it was not a good thing, but that pales in comparison to what you're dealing with right now. Uh, you're dealing with NIL coming up soon. You're dealing with immediate transfer in those last five sports uh, with no sit out. That's getting ready to happen. You're continuing to deal with COVID. You're dealing with how, how you even seat people at a game. So our governor says 7%. You could have 7%. So uh, they've worked it out. They know. Uh, and Saturday, there'll be 7% of the total capacity will show up. You're you're dealing with things now in, in COVID case, which I consider to be unique since it didn't happen since uh, 1918, or I think it was 1918. Uh, but the NIL is gonna, gonna be huge change, uh, as you know. Um, and uh, some questions don't change uh, and some issues don't change. So the two things I always dealt with primarily if you looked at a single day, either dealing with something related to personnel or something related to finance, and Craig made a mention of finance earlier, those two things never change. Now, you might have a compliance issue at some point in time, but it's not a day-to-day -day thing. I, I really believe day-to-day, -day, I always either dealt with personnel or finance uh, in one, one way or, or another. Uh, and those things are, are going to continue because you know uh, people move in our enterprise. Uh, they move for different title, they move a better title, they move for a, a different scope of duties, they move for more money, uh, they move for all kinds of reasons. And as an AD, uh, 
trying to keep your best people becomes a, a very important. It, you've invested a lot of time in certain individuals and, and you won't keep them all. And it'll make you angry too. Uh, I'll let Craig might have a word. I mean, I've had some times where I would just think, I cannot believe that person left us after what we have been through together. And, you know, this is an interesting, interesting dynamic. I've mentioned the word trust earlier. Uh, and that's part of it. It, it. When we hire people, I always met every six months, I would meet with new hires, have lunch with them. I had an outline. Um, my right hand, Michael Lippitz would be there with me. And uh, we would talk about what we can do for you, but what we expect from you. And one of the things I always said we expect from you is that you don't fly the coop in two years. You got to at least get four years in here. Show us that you can do something. It'll take you a year and a half to figure out where your parking spot is and what key to use if you're still using keys. Uh, I mean, really, just don't be so fast, so quick to climb the ladder of success in your career that you're going to jump at the next best thing or what looks like it will be the next best thing. Um, so I think those things uh, will continue. Thanks, Debbie. We're going to go to Mike Broker from Marquette, and we're going to direct this question to Doc Sander. We're going to get him involved in the process here. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, like Jeff said, Mike Broker from Mar Marquette, and I'm again, I want to thank everyone for, for taking the time to do this. My, my question is, our president talks about the, the triple crisis we're facing right now is social, economic, and health. And my question is really around decision making. And and your decision making as a leader and the process by which you made decisions during a crisis, was it different? Did it change because of the urgency and the magnitude around some of the decisions that were being made? Like, yeah, I mean, you guys clearly, like uh, Debbie said, are facing, you know, an incredible challenge. But I think, you know, you have to really establish what your priorities are. And I think that's what you live by. What are your priorities? You know, student athlete welfare, you know, success by, on the field or the court. Um, you know, graduating students, your ability to expose the brand of your institution. I think you have to develop those priorities and basically what your core value system is. And then you just have to, you know, you just have to evaluate every situation based upon, you know, those core values and, you know, your priorities. And when you do that, then I think you'll come to a decision at the end that is the best possible decision that you, that you can make. You know, I don't think you can ever, you know, you can ever kind of sacrifice, you know, your beliefs and, and what your value system is. So I think as long as you keep your value system and, you know, look at everything through that filter, you'll come up with the best decisions. And, you know, crises are, you know, things that you have to manage. Everybody's going to have them in one way or another. You know, when I was at VCU, we somehow or another, we were in the Metro Conference and all of a sudden we got a, we got a fax and said, you're no longer in the Metro Conference. You know, we're basically throwing you and Virginia Tech out. So, you know, that was a pretty big crisis, but we had to kind of look at that from the perspective of, you know, how was that affecting our student athletes? How was that affecting our university? And so we had to deal with that, but we kind of kept our value system. We kept what we believed in, and then we worked through it that way. So, I mean, that would be my thoughts about that. And I know, um, you know, but you have to have prepared, you have to be prepared. And I think the other thing that you have to do with is have, you know, a, a strategy and you have to be able to message all the important um, people. And the one thing that I believe in, I think, depending upon what the crisis is, you have to be honest. You know, I've seen people who've tried to, you know, try to frame everything to uh, mitigate against, uh, you know, uh, people's impressions and people's, uh, what they think might be a negative, but I think the reality of it is you deal with it once. You try to deal with the crisis one time and deal with it, accept it, get on with it, and be as honest as you can about you know the the situation that you're in. So um, I think whenever you have a crisis, you want to try to deal with it um, right now in the most efficient way possible and be honest because I've seen a lot of people make huge mistakes trying to convince people of something that it wasn't a crisis or whatever. It wasn't exactly honest. Be with it honest, deal with it one time. I, I mean, I believe in that, you know, whether it's you have to make a change in coaching, whether you have a student athlete that did something, deal with it one time and, you know, then get on with the rest of it. So that would be my, my thoughts. Thanks doc. Let's go to uh, Kit Hughes from Bowling Green. 
Sure, thanks, Jeff. And uh, like everybody else has said, just really appreciate you all having us on, on this. This is fantastic and a great opportunity. So thank you very much. You know, part of my question is something that Coach Yao already had touched upon just related to, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, working with staff very quickly to set expectations. Um, you know, my question uh, for the group is as a first time athletic director, how you fast track that buy in and trust with the staff that you inherit, um, you know, many with a long history at the university and some potentially even were interested in the job themselves. Um, just strategies that they use to kind of shorten that timeline, um, you know, and, and certainly as a first timer, probably inheriting a situation that may be far from perfect. There could be a crisis going on. There could be a lot of different challenges. If there are any examples of kind of working through something like that, that they might have from that first experience, we'd love to, to hear about them. Thank you, Kit. Uh, Craig, you want to take that one on? Yeah, let me let me take a shot at it. Um, and, and I think it's a, a great question. And I had the, <clears throat> excuse me, the luxury of being able to assume uh, an athletic director's uh, position, uh, having extensive uh, background uh, here at the, the, the University of Virginia uh, for for a number of years. Um, let me ask you if you can rephrase the question just just a little bit and so that I can zero in instead of a ramble, if you don't mind. Kit, make that question a little tighter. And yeah. Greg, we're going to need you to give us a tight yeah. answer because we're coming up okay. uh, quickly, quickly on the uh, end of the session. Okay. Sure. So, and, and, and honestly, this might be a difficult one, just given the, the, the position that you, you know, worked into, but fast tracking the trust in that new position with people who um, you may not completely agree with your vision. You may be new in your case, you weren't new. So there were some similarities and some overlaps. So you may all have been singing off the same songbook right from the beginning, you know, in a situation where that's not the case and you're, entering a, uh, a new culture, you're trying to set your own vision. You're trying to build trust with new people. You're trying to get them on board and have them buy into what you're trying to accomplish as a, as a new team. Okay. You know, how you went about accomplishing something like that. And, and in, in the context of, uh, of your background, it may, that might be different for you than it was for Debbie or even for Doc um, yeah. or Jeff. So. Greg, we got two minutes for this, please. Okay. Yeah. So my situation might have been a little bit different because I had worked at the University of Virginia a long time, had known all the people, um, knew what people's capabilities were, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So when I was named AD, I knew very clearly that there were a number of people that weren't going to fit our circumstances for what the future was. My charge was to build a top 10 program, a program that could, could on an annual basis perform among the top 10 programs in the country by any measurement, but in particular, the, uh, uh, the, the Director's Cup standing. And I knew that there were people uh, who were very good people, but because of their uh, backgrounds, weren't going to wor uh, uh, work very well in what the, the future of our department was going to be in terms of a very ambitious uh, uh, type of uh, situation to build our program. Uh, but the foundation of that program was going to be in uh, bringing the right people on board, bringing those right people and they're going to uh, approach things a little bit differently than, uh, than, than what they had done previously. So again, my, my, my circumstances were uh, just a little bit different from that uh, regard, but I did have uh, the opportunity uh, based on the relationship that I had built with all those staff people, I did have the opportunity to have those candid conversations uh, and people trusted me in terms of what it was that I was saying, even when the, uh, the, uh, the message was not a very positive one that they were not going to have a future in their current roles with what we were doing at the University of Virginia. But the fact that I was uh, having those conversations, that I was honest with them, that I wasn't stringing them along, that I was able to demonstrate for them that I had their futures in mind because with every person was going to move to a different area, I had a game plan for what it was that they would be able to do to help 
safeguard uh, our, our program, although maybe not in the current roles that they had, but that kind of open communication with people, letting them know what the vision was for the future and uh, why it was that I felt as though we needed something different in the position that they occupied. But uh, you know, just having those open conversations, sharing the vision, sharing what my, uh, 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 my, our president was expecting of me and why it was that we were going to be making a fundamental shift in the way that we were approaching our business at the University of Virginia in athletics. Thanks, Craig. Thanks so much. Thanks to all the uh, aspiring ADs for being here and investing in your careers so that you can better serve your student athletes, coaches, and staffs. Special thanks to Doc Sanders. And most importantly, special thanks to my colleagues, uh, Coach Little Page and Coach Yao. Thank you all very much.